Hello, welcome to the Run Testers. My name's Nick. I'm Mike. Uh, and in this video, we're going to give you a guide to the best Garmin watches on the market. So, obviously, we're going to cover off all the latest models in the range, the kind of current lineup, uh, with a real focus on how they work for runners. But we're also going to talk about some of the older models in the range that you know, are still available and offer great value. I think it's fair to say, Mike. Yeah, I know. And I mean, it's a huge range. And we know this is kind of the reason we want to do this video because. There are lots of good options, but I think it's really good to understand which ones are going to make the best sense. In terms of what you want as a runner, and things actually you can probably live without, and I think that's the main thing here we'll try and get through with this video. We've broken Garmin's range down to kind of five categories. Uh, we're going to go through those, talk about kind of entry-level watches, more mid-range watches, watches that we think offer great value. We'll have a look at the smart watches in Garmin's range, and then we'll dive into some detail on the most expensive watches and the kind of real flagship Phoenix Enduro Epix models. First category we look at is the entry level watches, Mike. Yeah, so this is, I guess, this, this is the category where you maybe are either looking for your first running watch or you are actually, you know, I only really want this kind of very basic kind of running experience in terms of the Garmin range. So um, I think the, the watches we mainly picked out for in this are the Garmin 4 55 the Garmin 4 Runner 45, which precedes the 55, and then there's a 245 and the Vivo Active 4. So I think the best one to start with is the 4 Runner 55. And you know, it's kind of a no frills running watch, but it does have a bit more to it in comparison to what we got on the 45. So uh, it's, you know, it's a really kind of small, kind of light, comfortable watch. You're getting all the kind of core running metrics you expect to see. What you're getting here that you don't get on the 45, I think is the key things here, are things uh, like the daily um, suggested workouts, the improved recovery advisor. You're getting full Connect IQ support on the 45. You only had kind of access to the watch faces essentially. Now you're getting the kind of full, um, you know, you're opening it up to apps and data fields and things like that. So, and then battery, in terms of battery life, you're getting, you know, you should be getting about a week's worth of battery life in terms of this watch. That's, you know, that's kind of what I found, Jeremy. I think you found as well, Nick. Yeah, 55 is now like the entry level model in Garmin's range. And I suppose now it's one of those classic things where features are dripping down from mid range watches to make it a watch that actually would satisfy the vast majority of runners. It's a great no frills option. I suppose. I think that it was a big step up on the 45 in a sense. 45 was also that, I guess. It, it is a watch that will satisfy most runners, but yeah, losing, it had a fair bit less battery life, I think, a little bit of that training analysis, suggested workouts, things like that, I think make the 55 a little bit more interesting, I think, even at the beginner end. Yeah, and then, uh, then as, as you said, there's the Garmin 4 on a 45. There, I think, you know, you're getting the core running experience there on that watch is very similar, but ultimately you maybe you're not getting those so extra software features that we've mentioned on the 55. Um, you're getting two size options as well. So the 55, you've only got one size option. The 45, you've got a couple of options to choose from there. Then obviously I think the key things here really is that you are not getting uh, that full Connect IQ support on the 55. You can kind of download watch faces, but essentially it's very much, you know, this running focused watch, keeping it to those kind of simple kind of those main core stats that most people will be happy with. Um, now, obviously, um, in terms of, you know, features that you're not probably going to get and see at the, this end of the market are kind of navigation and kind of mapping features, which are kind of reserved for pricier Garmin's. But that's not to say that the 4Runner 45 isn't a watch that you can still consider and look at um, now. Yeah, and I think actually on that kind of navigation front, this is one of our other interesting budget picks. An older watch is the 4Runner 245, which was the kind of best mid-range watch in Garmin's lineup. It's now been replaced by the 255. And that means the 245 is dropping, you know, not far off £100 for the non-music edition. Even the music edition is well under £200 at times. That, that you are going to get an upgrade in training analysis. You are going to get breadcrumb navigation and turn-by-turn -turn directions. And obviously in the music version of the watch, you're going to get music. And it's a slightly bigger watch, so you get a little bit more battery life, but you're still kind of looking at around a week, it's fair to say. And I think when you're talking about older models in this category, you know, there is the classics, the Forerunner 30 and 35, the old kind of square, really cool, good running watches, but I think at this point, they're not that easy to find. And even if you do find them, they're not necessarily a lot cheaper than the 45 or 55. So if I was looking for an old watch as a kind of bargain model in Garmin's range, it would probably be the 245. You might end up paying slightly more, more like 150, but you're gonna get a whole lot more watch, especially for that breadcrumb navigation and turn-by-turn -turn directions, which I think is massive. Every time I'm in a new place, the first thing I do is load up some routes on my Garmin and go out and follow them and, you know, don't get lost. Yeah, and I think we, we, we talked about those those older watches that you mentioned, and I think now it's at a point where I think from a, I would say probably from a kind of stability, kind of software point of view, 
it, it makes sense to go for the these models now i think based on what you're getting and in terms of the support i think uh, although you you know th those watches will still give you a very good kind of you know very basic but solid kind of running experience i think in terms of what you're getting on things like the the 245 45 55 i think it feels like it justifies kind of going up and paying for those those new ones i think you know based on my testing yeah, I agree. And then the other model we mentioned, this is more of an entry-level watch if you're looking for a slightly smarter looking watch, I guess, in Garmin's range. That's the Vivo Active 4? Yeah, so the Vivo Active 4, I mean, essentially the way I look at it, it's a bit like the original Garmin venue, but ultimately you're not getting the AMOLED screen. In terms of all the tracking that you're getting on the venue, which you know, we'll get into in the kind of smartwatch section, um, you are getting, you know, you're getting the ability to to track your runs you're getting kind of smartwatch style features um you know it, you're not getting mapping and navigation but in terms of that core kind of tracking experience and being able to pair heart rate sensors to it you know you're good you're still going to get a, run, a good running experience so again that's one that's available in a couple of sizes so you can potentially you can kind of pick them up a little bit cheaper you know it's, it's a few years old now but i still think it stands as a good option for a lot of people so i think that's definitely in terms of this price range it's still one worth Kind of considering i think you're getting a step up in terms of those smartwatch features that you don't get on the kind of 45 and 55 and if you wanted that kind of smartwatch kind of feel at this kind of price range i think that's a good option uh, to look at right next up we're looking at the kind of mid-range of garmin's uh garmin's you know range of watches it's kind of they're offering really good balance of price and features this is actually a lot of the most popular watches are found in garmin's range so Got three, I think, big options here, Mike, and it almost depends on what you're looking for. There's the Forerunner 255, which is now a full triathlon watch, but is kind of the classic Garmin mid-range watch, the successor to the 235 and 245, very popular watches. Then if you want the more rugged look, the kind of outdoorsy look, you've got the Instinct 2 or the Instinct 2 Solar. And then there's a kind of Garmin smartest kind of mid-range watch is the Garmin Venue 2. So maybe you could walk us through what the differences are between those three biggies in this category. Yeah, so the Garmin 400 255, so obviously the 235, 245 have been very popular watches and for good reason because they kind of sit at this really kind of nice sweet spot in terms of features, in terms of price, in terms of if you're thinking about, I want to delve a bit more into my kind of training and my analysis. So that's what I would say on the 255 you're kind of getting. I think the key things on the 255 that I would pull out, you're getting the uh, multi-band mode, which I know Nick didn't have an amazing experience with, but I know it's a feature that we've seen um, improve that outdoor tracking accuracy and if that's something that you care about I mean I, I I personally have had a good experience with it and it's I've been able to kind of replicate a little bit more what I've got with other Garmin watches that support that feature um, you are getting an altimeter which you don't get on the Forerunner 245 so you get some extra kind of data in terms of uh, when you're out and running um, and you do have breadcrumb navigation there as well on the 255 so that there's a there's a lot of reasons there to, su to suggest this is a good option for most people I think and if you want to spend a little bit more money over getting something a bit more comprehensive in terms of sports tracking and top of your running um, I think that you know that's what you get from the 255. Yeah you're also now getting two sizes of it which is good I think the 255 is a really nice watch to have it's so small small dinky and it's packed with features and that's really good people have smaller wrists who don't want to have like a big old phoenix on the wrist or something like that and get everything. It's also got the heart rate variability status new feature and Garmin's morning report which you know is a nice little touch in the morning to get a little idea about your training that your what what your suggested workouts are what the weather is that kind of thing so yeah it's a very comprehensive watch and now obviously we're not triathletes here ourselves but it does cater to triathletes and that's you know a big plus point for them the addition of the triathlon mode also kind of really kills off the forerunner 745 since the 255 has basically all the features plus a few new ones uh, and comes in at a lower price uh, and I think it's probably certainly compared when we compare it to the Instinct 2 Solar, the 255 does offer more in the way in training analysis and that kind of thing. But what the Instinct brings is battery life and, you know, that kind of G-Shock look, let's say. Um, so whereas the 400 255 for us was probably lasting just slightly less than a week, that's with the smaller 255S model, the Instinct, will, you know, especially the Solar version will last you a couple of weeks, really. Yeah, and I think yeah, with the Instinct, I think the original instinct I think we were kind of on the fence in terms of how well it performed as it all was designed as a running watch and now what you're getting I think you're getting something that you know you have those that extra training analysis that you get from those forerunner watches that you've got that um, breadcrumb navigation I think the the screen works quite nicely in terms of, of you letting you you know use that for mapping and getting you know kind of getting around and you know finding your way around and then you'd have that battery life and if you want the solar and you can 
the, th the thing with solar is, is you have to be in the optimal conditions to really feel the benefits of it. And if you do, and if you are, and you're out a lot, lot, you know, lots of time of the week, then potentially you can. But it really, really depends on on having that, you know, maximum kind of exposure that you need to get the most of it. But that is a that is a, uh, that now feels instinct to like a really good running watch for people who want that kind of rugged outdoor kind of design and look. Yeah, definitely. I fully agree. Like in the past, you weren't, you would, you simply weren't getting the. Um... The training analysis it wasn't really comparable to the forerunner 245 or 255 and now it actually covers off the key areas whilst having that different but the screen isn't entirely to my taste i think you know you get a little bit less room but it is perfectly clear to see you know in all conditions you certainly can use it for navigation and everything so it's it's really a different style there and there are so many instinct two styles as well like loads of different colors so that's really nice about it and then speaking of style uh, in this category we also have the venue 2 which is a very stylish screen this is the first sight of an amoled screen in garmin's lineup yeah so the venue series is pretty much that's what it's known that's kind of what it's renowned for this is kind of garmin's for well was it's kind of first proper kind of smart watch device and obviously it's cheap in the epics which we'll talk about later and obviously has that amoled screen as well now again you are getting you know a lot of what you see on the vivo active series in terms of that running experience you're not going to get kind of mapping and navigation support um, and some of those kind of extra training insights that you'll get on the kind of top end forerunners but you will get that kind of core garmin kind of tracking experience i mean you put, you're going to lose a bit in terms of battery life in terms of what you get and especially if you have the screen and always on it's going to get down to the days as opposed to kind of a week but if you are looking for a the idea of having a smartwatch you know and you're getting payments and music and all those things and then you've got that kind of core garmin running experience that's what you're going to get from the venue too and now that there are other venue two models out that you'll probably see that um around a kind of a different price as well the venue two and i think yeah it's a really good option if you are kind of looking for a smartwatch for running you know you don't have an iphone and you know you're not absolutely convinced on an apple watch then this is a this is a good option it's a good option for android um users as well yeah definitely i think we've covered it already but it's worth giving the vivo active for a quick mention here and that it does offer a lot of the same stuff as the venue two the screen's not quite as nice but it's still a pretty nice screen and that's another decent mid-range option from Garmin. So next up, we've got the, the best value Garmin. Now, obviously we've talked about all-rounders like the 255, but there's a case of saying other watches offer a little bit of value, better value than that to runners, particularly because one of the main upgrades on the 255 is a triathlon mode that I will never use, for example. Uh, <laughs> so if we're looking at pure bang for your buck, what watch can give you the most? I think there's probably three kind of standout models here, I think, in the range. One is the older Garmin 245, which is dropping in price all the time and is now just such a good running watch to get for well under £200 at times. Um, then we've actually got quite a pricey model here. We're going to discuss it more in the coming up in the sections coming up. But the Garmin Forerunner 955 uh, basically gets you all the features your things like the Phoenix, the Epics for like hundreds of pounds less. Um, it can't be like it can't be expressed how much how expensive some of those top models are in Garmin's range. And the 955 really does offer a cheaper route to those features. And then there's obviously the Forerunner 55. It's another really nice uh, kind of cheaper model which is actually in sales a fair bit itself now. It does really offer everything you need uh, as a running watch for a lot less. So in terms of value, we've got kind of got three price points within this value section, but I think they all offer a tremendous amount for the money you're going to spend on them. I think it's fair to say, Mike. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, this is uh, people are going to be playing in different kind of price ranges in terms of what they want to spend. And I think what we try to do is kind of represent that. And I think the, the 245, and this is the case that, you know, this isn't the latest in this kind of range of uh, Garmin's Forerunner, but ultimately I still think it performs really well as a runner, which is one that I would probably still recommend as well. I think, you know, in terms of that kind of pure running kind of performance and tracking, it's very solid. You don't have the the multi-band mode that you get on the 255, but I, I think for most people, the 245's performance in terms of GPS tracking is going to be absolutely fine. In terms like, you know, heart rate monitoring performance as well, you know, outside of kind of the high intensity stuff where you're probably going to need an external um, sensor. Um, I think that, you know, you're not getting some of the kind of things like HRV status and you're not getting that, um, you know, triathlon mode or some of those like, kind of extra sports features. But I think ultimately in terms of the, the design, in terms of the, the running features you're getting, you're getting those smartwatch features if you want them as well. It's a really good option, I think, still to look at. And yeah, don't discount some of these older models. I think that's a key thing for us to say here and we wouldn't either. So, um, and then the 455, that is obviously sits as 
kind of Garmin's kind of latest entry level watch. But I think in terms of the price, in terms of the fact that Garmin has taken this watch and started to give it the smarter kind of training features that you're seeing on more expensive 4 hour watches, and you're still getting things like a week's worth of training out of it, um, and you're getting that Connect IQ Sport, which you know gives you that scope to personalize it a bit more in terms of apps and data fields and things like that. I think that's, that makes it a really affordable, good option to look at as well. Um, and then, yeah, the 955, I mean, it's expensive. We know that. It is an expensive watch. But you put it in, this, in the kind of grand scheme of where it sits with the Phoenix and things like the Epics in terms of features. And what you're getting, you're getting those features, most of those features for less money. And if you look at it from that point of view and you are looking for a high-end watch that has mapping, that has a kind of, you know, a kind of deeper in terms of that kind of analysis, things like training readiness, what we've talked about in our review video, and we've really liked and that kind of application of it on the 955. Um, and then everything you would expect to get from a multi-sports watch as well, then you look at it from that point of view, that it makes it a really good value watch. And I think these are really good options across that those prices. Yeah, definitely. I say that, and I think, the thing with the 955, I think it's a really considerable step up on the 945 in terms of the cool new training analysis you're getting. And the fact that actually it's cheaper on RRP than the 945. So 945, you might find it in a really good deal, but actually it's often not available for much less than the 955, which is why the new model, you know, which is still going to get supported with updates and all that is the better value option. Um, and yeah, I'd say, yeah, if you're going for this, the cheapest, you know, the best kind of entry level model, the best value is probably the 455. And then if you want maps and music, maybe look at that 245. Next up, we've got kind of the best smartwatches in Garmin's range. Now, Garmin's smart features obviously don't, aren't comparable to things like the Apple Watch or a Samsung Watch, but they are pretty good nowadays. And we've talked a bit about the Venue and Vivo Active already, Mike, but what about some of the cheaper smart models in Garmin's range? Yeah, so a couple we can talk about here are, I would start with probably the Venue SQ. So this is a, a square version of the Venue, the Venue 2. There's also the Venue 2 Plus as well. And essentially, you are getting, you know, that kind of same level of smart watch support. You're getting the same level of running support. You're getting, you know, the, in terms of the case design and some of the materials, you have at play the screen um a screen technology that you're getting on the venue q is not quite as good quality as what you're getting on the venue 2 so you're getting an amoled and then it's sort of kind of liquid crystal display on the um of venue sq so it's still a color display but you know if you up close you know that the other one the amoled is a bit more vibrant a bit more colorful um but essentially in terms of what you're getting in running features and in terms of the level of battery life you can expect to get you're still getting that from the venue sq and then you're getting that for less money you also have a music version as well so you want those features but you know in terms of what you're getting in terms of smartwatch running features, in terms of battery performance, you're getting it there and for less. You're just kind of making some compromises, I think, in terms of the case materials and the kind of the display as well. But ultimately, the the running kind of tracking experience is very similar. Yeah, yeah, it's, it does. It is of a you know pretty good feature set. I I really don't like the look of it. Much. I don't enjoy <laughs> using it very much, so I I kind of discount it quite quickly in my mind. But you know, it is a very good value watch. And if you do like the look or don't mind the look, then it does offer you a good bang for your buck. In the time between filming and releasing this video, Garmin did actually announce the Venue Square Two and Square Two Music. Both of these watches do have an AMOLED screen, as well as having a bigger battery life than the original Venue Square and offering multi GNSS tracking. We have the watch in for testing and we'll get a review up as soon as possible to see if it's a good budget alternative to the Venue 2 but we didn't have it in time for this video. It costs £229.99 for the Venue Square 2 and the Venue Square 2 music is £269.99. I suppose really the Venue 2 sits as the most obvious smartwatch option in Garmin's range unless you're prepared to splash out the big money on the FX which is you know has all the top features you're going to get from Garmin with a really nice crisp AMOLED display and it gets a pretty good battery life around four or five days even with heavy use um, and you know you're getting maps music all the best training analysis you can get from Garmin it's, it's an incredibly expensive watch but if you are just looking for an AMOLED screen and want the best for Garmin the Epix is probably worth spending a it's probably worth splashing out on compared to the venue but the venue certainly offers better value for money yeah definitely oh the other thing obviously great thing about Garmin smarter watches is that they're you know uh, they're platform agnostics, that's what they call it. Uh, they don't care if you're using an iPhone or whatever and everything like that, whereas you know, everything else is a bit of a faff if you don't have the right phone or, or doesn't work at all in the case of the Apple Watch. But yeah, there's also another nifty little option here in this called the Vivo Move Sport, which is the kind of slightly analog looking watch. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, so I would, I mean, I kind of classify this as kind of a hybrid smartwatch. So you're getting kind of that kind of traditional watch style look, 
but you're also getting kind of a digital display kind of baked into it. Now, the thing with the Viva Move Sport, there's loads of kind of models in that range. The Viva Move Sport is the cheapest kind of entry into that kind of space. So in terms of in comparison to the other Vivo moves, the more expensive models you're getting a kind of lower resolution or kind of lower quality kind of display, but essentially you are still getting a digital display. Now, the key thing here is that you're not getting built-in GPS. You are getting connected GPS. So obviously you would prefer to have built-in GPS, but I, what I would say about this is, you know, I've tested a lot of watches that offer connected GPS. And in terms of that gets connected GPS and having to piggyback off your phone signal i found that the kind of performance of that with this watch has probably been among the best that i've used now you're making compromises in terms of what you can see in that display and how easy it's to kind of absorb that information but in terms of the kind of tracking and kind of data performance that i've got from the or i found from the vivo, vivo move sport it's actually been pretty solid and if you are kind of looking for something that's not quite full sports watch full kind of you no know, top end kind of garmin and you know you you still but you still want that experience and some of those those functionalities and a kind of nicer looking design the vivo move move sport is one to potentially look at i think and i suppose we should quickly say for those who have skipped straight to the smartwatch section and haven't watched us talk about the venue already um uh, that's got the kind of the best screen uh, in the lower price points in garmin's range it's very similar to the vivo active 4 in lots of ways in terms of the features available but the venue is a real step up in terms of looks and screen quality yeah definitely i think the venue of all there so the, you have the venue sq you have the original venue the venue 2 and the venue 2 plus the venue 2 is the model i think you know the, the kind of the standout kind of smartwatch one outside of the epics i would say just to know the venue 2 plus essentially that is more expensive you are the main things you're getting in comparison to the venue 2 are the added voice features the ability to use your your voice assistant through the watch but i think outside of that you, you know the everything else is pretty much similar so unless you're really sold on having that as an extra feature and it's for a considerable amount more i think um the venue 2 is the ones to go for say a core running experience very very good battery life can probably get you around just under a week i think and then all the smartwatch features and the best kind of display that you can get essentially um amoled display touchscreen display um in terms of garbage range Okay, on to the high-end premium Garmin's, the ones where it's just absolute money everywhere. Um, and there's, there's actually a lot of models in this range now. Garmin's really filled out this category in recent years, and there's probably uh, four big ones here, which is the 4Runner 955, the Epix 2, the Phoenix 7 range, and then the Enduro 2. Now, all of these watches are packing the best of everything. You, know, you are getting full color maps, Garmin's exceptional navigation features with things like Climb Pro and Next Fork, which will you know show you the next fork in your trail, even if you're not don't have a route loaded, that kind of thing. You get music support, access to you know streaming services like Spotify if you have a premium account, getting very detailed training analysis of acclimation to heat and altitude, you know, being shown on there, race predictors with trends over time. All the new stuff like training readiness um, and the morning report will come to these watches in time, I believe, uh, and HRV status. Basically, if Garmin does it, it's on these watches and you're also getting, in some cases, you know, absurd battery life. Probably the easiest way to look at this is, <laughs> i say the 955 is the very, very good value option. It's got a lighter case, a plastic case. Um, it's coming in you know, hundreds of pounds less than equivalent models in the Epics and Phoenix ranges. And what you get essentially is a stripped back model in terms of looks, but a very, very smart model in terms of the features on offer and the battery life a little bit less than the Phoenix and Enduro 2. It comes in at you know, around just over a week, I think we kind of got from it. Wasn't that right, Mike? And that was the solar version? Yeah. Uh, I'd say we're both agreed on this, by the way. Don't get the solar version. <laughs> like, uh, you know, it might add a couple of, maybe one day of battery, but it's a fair bit more money. And I think the screens are slightly worse on solar Garmin's because they sit a bit deeper behind the glass because of that solar glass. So with the Enduro 2 and the Instinct, the difference in battery life might be considerable because they have such big batteries, but with the 4Runner 955, I don't think it's worth it. I'd look at the non-solar edition. And from there, we've got a watch that's been very close to our hearts this year, Mike. It's, it's become my go-to watch, um, and I don't know if it's the same for you as the Epix too. Now, this AMOLED screen, it might seem like, oh, an AMOLED screen, how much difference does it make? But in terms of quality of life, I think the AMOLED screen on the Epix is such a big upgrade on the Phoenix and Enduro. Yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, I, you know I've been fortunate to use most of these new Garmin watches that are kind of at the top end and I think the one that uh, th though I'm testing other things at the moment when I've got my wrist spare again the Epix is going to go back on and I I think the key thing for me is that you know I was worried about having to make compromises in terms of the battery life and worrying about having to charge it in a more regular basis because obviously the Phoenix will get you more battery life that is you know that's clear 
but I, I found it absolutely fine from that point of view. And I think, you know, one thing Garmin has done on their new range in general is add touchscreens. And I, and I think it makes more sense on the Epics than it does on the Phoenix for me. I use it more just because it just feels like it makes more sense in terms of getting through screens um, on, on the Epics. But I think, you know, even when you've got that multi-band mode in use, which I pretty much use the watching now, the, you know, and the battery life hit that you get, you're still going to get a good week. If you're going to use always on display, you are going to get less. But if you're willing to, you know, it's not as bad as some of, as using always on displays on some other kind of dedicated smartwatches that are probably, you know, are dedicating a lot more time and power to other things. But in terms of that kind of tracking experience, it is so, it, I, for me, it is still so good. And I'm willing to make those compromises in the battery life, but I don't think you're making a huge compromise in terms of that battery life. To have that AMOLED screen, all those features like mapping, multiband mode, and all kind of, if you want the smartwatch features, those are there to kind of delve into too. Yeah, I think, like I said, you have this batch, like, like they list it as six days and always on mode to smartwatch. So when I was running, you know, 80k a week, I got five days of battery life out. Now I'm running 110k a week, I get four days of battery life out of it. And that's with yours on screen on and uh, multi-band GPS engaged. That I think is fine. Uh, I also say with the Epix, I think the mapping features are a significant upgrade on the Epix's screen compared to, especially the solar versions of the Gar models. It's so much easier to follow a map on route on the Epix, especially under kind of dappled light or tree cover than it is on some of those. In, in the full sunlight, they've all got great screens. But um, yeah, I think that screen is a big upgrade. If you don't have it, then you're basically looking at the Phoenix 7 range. And it, the Enduro is almost an extension of that range. It's basically a Phoenix 7X Ultra or, you know, plus, because it's, they're very similar watches all around. They do the same kind of things. I've got them both on here. Uh, the Enduro does have a slightly nicer look with those yellow accents, I think. Um, but I would say, for me, the Phoenix 7X was probably getting me three or four times the battery life of the Epics, and the Enduro looks like it might be five or six times. So we're talking, you know, weeks, maybe months. If you're, you know, not running 110k a week, you're running a bit less, you're going to get over a month probably for the Enduro. It's a very clear choice, really. You uh, you want the screen or do you want that extravagant battery life? Yeah, and I think, yeah, uh, based on my test, and 7X is probably the, the biggest battery outside of the kind of the Enduro, and I've only just got the Enduro in to kind of start testing. But I think in terms of those Phoenix ranges, if you really wanted the biggest battery life, the 7X based on kind of our testing is that's the one that's going to get you. It probably isn't going to be the watch that everyone needs. So I think the Phoenix 7 and the kind of Phoenix 7S will get you still weeks as well. And if you want all of those, those big Garmin features, all the big running features, all the analysis, all the training, all the features that will get you, you know, that kind of accurate data, then you can get those watches and that's what they're going to give you. I mean, the 7X, I think, you know, is it's not going to be for everyone. It's, I don't think that's the watch that everyone should be looking at in the range. I think probably you can go for less, but if you really are desperate for that months away, you know, kind of month away from almost, you know, from your, from charging, then that would be a reason. You do have that flashlight as well, which we have, we've bigged up in previous videos. So if you want that, I mean, that's also on the Enduro. There's a brighter one on the Enduro. So Enduro 2, um, yeah. Oh, too bright. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's the key thing here. I think when the Phoenix range, you look at the Epics and an Enduro 2, I think, you know, Enduro 2 and 7X are the ones if you want the really big battery life. I think the other models will give you all that big, that kind of key experience with a slight drop off in battery life, but I don't think a huge, huge amount in terms of what you're getting, in terms of performance, in terms of the features you've got at your disposal. I think one thing also to flag up, and with Phoenix and Epic, and this, I think this is a massive misstep by Garvin, uh, which basically when they launched these two models, they only put multi-band GPS on the Sapphire models. Um, which at the time was like, oh, well, you know, you have to pay a bit more to get the multiband GPS. But now multiband GPS is on like the 255S. It's, um, it's absolutely outrageous, in my opinion, that the cheapest version of the Epix doesn't have that on it. Um, so that's something to look out for, because I think the multiband GPS on these models is a particularly big, you know, upgrade. I think the Epix 2 is the most accurate watch I've ever used, um, even compared to the other Garmin models. It might be like a watch, might, I know someone else's Epix might not be quite as good as, but, you know, it does seem to be particularly phenomenal for me. And I think that is why it's such a big upgrade. And that's why I think in this high-end category, you can look at some older models, but I think you are gonna get a big drop off. So we've got the Phoenix 6 Pro here. This is the watch I used a lot. Phoenix 6 Pro was a watch that was notoriously flaky on kind of GPS accuracy. And I used it as my main watch for like a year and a half and I you know, lived with it. Um, but I think the quality of life step up for the GPS alone on the new models is worth looking at, especially if you can get it in the 4 and a 955, which is still reasonably good value, even compared to the 6 Pro. So I. You can look at this older watch and you're going to get the maps, you're going to get the music, you're probably not going to be getting, you aren't going to get the new features like training readiness, you're not going to be supported with software updates, and the GPS is, I think, considerably worse on the older Phoenix. So I think if you are looking at this, you know, money no object category, you've basically got value in the 955, the screen of the Epics, or the battery life of the um, Phoenix and Ultra, and not Ultra, the Air Enduro 2. 
Right, we've got a very quick last section here. We've given a lot of details on all these watches. We're gonna give you our quick top picks and this is gonna be one line on each watch. Go and watch the full sections if you want the deeper explanation. But for kind of beginner, entry level watch, uh, I think we've both settled on the Forerunner 55. Is that fair, Mike? Yeah, Forerunner 55, I think kind of no nonsense kind of no frills watch if you want it but if you want those extra kind of training kind of elements there that you have that there to kind of tap in if you're starting to get a bit more confident i think and you want to know a little bit more about your runs and how you can kind of make improvements as well and then in the all-rounder category the kind of mid-range garmin watches the forerunner 255 stands out it's got a triathlon mode which is handy if not for us but you are getting multi-band gps and really detailed training analysis it's a slightly better training companion for runners than the instinct two solar but that's another good watch there but yeah the forerunner 255 would be our pick here then, if we're looking at value, uh, I think this is a, a tough one, but what do you reckon, Mike? The 400 245 maybe tops it? I think, you know, in terms of for, for most people, I think the 245 is going to be the one to go for. As we kind of mentioned, you know, you're still getting a very good running ex kind of tracking experience with that watch. And I think if we're looking kind of at the higher ends and we, uh, so we're comparing it to some of the more expensive models and you, you do want to spend for those extra features. I think the 4105 955 makes the most sense in terms of value at the top ends of kind of Garmin's range in terms of the feature you're getting from the Phoenix. And I think the, the design makes it makes more sense in terms of running a watch, I think, as well in, com in comparison to some of those you know, things like the Phoenix and the Epics as well. Brilliant. And then smartwatch, uh, just, you know, a lot going on here, but probably the Venue 2 is the best all-round smartwatch in Garmin's range in terms of value. <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of value, Venue 2 is the one to get. If you could spend, I would go for the Epics too, but I think most people won't. I think if you do just want a good mix of smartwatch and kind of run kind of features, then I think the Venue 2, out of all the Venue models, that is the one that I would be, I think we would be going for. And then in the high-end category, there's really, there is a pretty simple choice. There's some fantastic features here. If you want to spend a little bit less, get a lighter watch. The 955 is great. If you want the battery life, look at the Phoenix 7 range, look at the Enduro 2. But we love, unless you're like an ultra marathoner, I think the Epix 2 is probably the best bit because yeah, four or five days battery life. As a very keen marathon training runner, that's perfect for me. I think the Epix 2 is the best top-end going watch because that screen is such a big upgrade. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I mean, I, th there's a reason why uh, I'm still I'm still using it essentially in terms uh, like in terms of the performance, in terms of the track, in terms of that multi band mode performance, uh, and I'm getting enough battery life to satisfy in terms of my training and the, the level of training I kind of do. And I think for most people, it's it's going to be absolutely enough in terms of the features. And yeah, I think the mapping is elevated by having that colour screen if that's something that you care about as well on your running watch. All right, that is it, guys. That is our comprehensive, uh, incredibly long. If you made it this far, thank you very much. Uh, um, a guide to Garmin's current range and a few great older models we like. Uh, what should they do, Mike, before they leave? They should like and subscribe, definitely. They should <laughs> ring that little bell to find out about our latest videos. And yeah, then you know, see us for our next run tester video. It's going to yeah. be a good one. I'm sure it will be. It'll be great. <laughs> or just watch this one again. You know, we've got half hour free. Right. Watch this one again. <laughs> see you guys later.